Welcome to the Life Hacks Show. Life Hacks gives you proof hacks and tips for the best version of yourself. And here is your crash test dummy for a better life, Marcus Moira. Hey guys, welcome to a new episode of the Life Hacks Show. This time, once again, from the topical co-working space, Co-Hub on Koh Lanta, Thailand. And we are still here with the guys from the Denix camp, but here are even more interesting people hanging around, especially in the Co-Hub. And one of these interesting um, people and very widely known uh, as an online entrepreneur, living location independent is Johnny FD. Welcome, Johnny. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much. Really glad to be on the show. Uh, and it's fun to be out here on this island with you. Yeah, um, same for me. So, Johnny, what do you think? Why are you so widely known and so more or less popular whenever I bump into a digital nomad? Um, people start asking, do you know this Johnny from Chiang Mai? And so I think many people know you for different reasons. What, what do you think? Why are you so, so big in the game? Uh, I, I think it's only because I started blogging about it uh, a long time ago. Um, I'm not special or anything. It's just... When I started blogging about it, even three years ago, which is not that long, uh, there was not many people who were openly talking about what they were doing, uh, either because they weren't the digital magic wasn't that big back then, uh, or because you know they were afraid to be too transparent, you know, with what they're making. Uh, they're making money online, especially while living in Thailand or traveling, uh, or they just didn't want you know they just didn't have the personality for it, but. For me, I always blogged. I always had blogs about various subjects and scuba diving, Muay Thai, uh, cost of living, stuff like that. I just and, and even though I never made money from my blogs or never made more than a few hundred dollars, uh, I just always enjoyed doing it. So it just it was very easy for me to continue talking openly about what I'm doing when I became a digital nomad. Mm -hmm. Do you think this changed somehow now as more and more people are, are going very public with, with this lifestyle and blogging about this and being very transparent do you, do you think it changed or is it just the amount of people who are doing this lifestyle now so that they are popping up more and more blogs and resources I think the amount of blogs now are, are in the, probably the hundred thousands or millions even <laughs> uh, so I actually probably would not recommend most people to start a, a digital nomad blog or travel blog with the sole intention of making it your primary business. I think everyone should start one just for fun to share with their friends and family. And what, what I think is very cool for, especially people starting out, um, starting a blog, not for making money, but for understanding how a website works and how the internet works and how backend originally looks like and what happens if you click on the publish button and how to move icons within the website. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I learned so much from blogging for free, which is what I called it for the last, you know, eight years. I was making different blogs where I would learn the basics of WordPress or the basics of like how to resize an image. And these are things that are important no matter what business you get into, whether you're doing e-commerce or, uh, you know, book sales or selling on Amazon, whatever it is, you need to learn basic web skills. And my free education was learning how to blog. Mm hmm do, do you think there's a, a mind shift in, in the people who, who are now starting out into this um, digital nomad lifestyle uh, nowadays? And when you started out uh, some years ago, as, as you said, people were not so transparent or was it like another time? Did, yeah. What did change since then? I think uh, now that there are so, so many you know, kind of prolific or successful digital nomads that it's kind of a cool thing to be now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very easy to like jump on board and say, oh, I'm also a digital nomad. Whatever, whatever this means. Eh? Whatever it means, yeah. It has to be de still defined, I think. But I think uh, even three years ago, it wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, if anything, people kind of looked down on you uh, or they gave you a million reasons why you shouldn't be doing it. So you, it, it was almost uh, easier just to hide. And like I lied to my parents and I said, oh, I'm coming just for three weeks. Uh, I'm just going to do a scuba diving course and I'm going to go home. <laughs> uh, but now it's very normal to tell your, even your parents say, hey, uh, I want to pursue, become an entrepreneur online. And there's this big community in Chiang Mai or wherever it is. Mm. Uh, and, or I've signed up for a, a proper uh, a camp or, you know, a 12 month <laughs> program mm -hmm. where they'll take you around the world. And um, they'll, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more, 
more sustain, uh, systematized now, I think. So it's very normal for people to say, okay, I'm going to go do this. While mm-hmm. before it was like, people thought you were crazy. It's very interesting that you have the, the same experience because when we came up with this idea of doing a conference and name it DJ Nomad Conference, um, the people who were already in this field said, mm, okay, it's very cool. I like you, Marcus Philly, what you're doing and, and your approach and being transparent, authentic and, and educate the people to do cool stuff and, and sustainable things and not just uh, rip off things with, which were there in, in these times before. But um, I don't call myself a DJ Nomad. I'm a location independent entrepreneur or something mm-hmm. like this. Um, but still, I want to support you. I come on the conference. And now, also, these people, everybody um, claims very big on their website. They are the DJ Nomad number one, have been ever since in the field. But it's funny when I scroll the old emails, they say, no, don't please call me DJ Nomad. Now everybody wants to be called. But for us, it helped, on the other hand, to get the word out because people were, the first time they were shocked a little bit, said, what are you, Marcos? But you're nomading. You don't have a proper home and mm-hmm. especially in Germany it's even more negative this same term nomading or nomad itself so it helped in a way and then it started to catch up and, and the papers understood what we were doing in the beginning we were on the travel pages and then on the lifestyle pages now we are in the business pages mm. so it's very interesting what's going on since then I think of it is very similar to like the paleo movement where in the beginning paleo the paleo diet just referred to what people you know tens of thousands of years ago during the Paleolithic caveman period would eat. And people would argue saying, oh, well, back then cavemen didn't have uh, access to whole foods or to whatever this is. But the actual diet now has evolved where they say, okay, it's just a name. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. an easy way for people to identify uh, the movement or the type of diet. Uh, while what we really are is we are trying to eat um, unprocessed foods and you know more like uh, more foods that you can source or grow yourself, you know, and without so many additives or GMOs and things like that. For digital nomads, I think it's the same thing, where most of us are not actually nomads. You know, we're not uh, just traveling uh, aimlessly around the world with everything on our back. A lot of us have a home base. Uh, I live in Chiang Mai most of the year. I keep an apartment the entire year, uh, but I travel whenever I feel like it uh, or (laughs) whenever my visa runs out, which is usually every two or three months. So it's one of those things where Saying, you know, using the term digital nomad is a lot easier than saying, I am a location independent entrepreneur that likes to travel every two or three months to a different city to meet with other uh, location independent entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Um, good that you brought up um, the thing that traveling too quick doesn't help anybody. It's more for backpackers or for, for people who are on a holiday. But if you want to pro- be productive on the road, I don't know how often do you switch your, your locations, but for us it's like every two or three months if we want to get really productive. And as you said, we also ha- have a home base in, in Berlin, but we are trying to set up different home bases now. Um, probably in Brazil will be one for the winter. Um, we love it very much here in Thailand and Phuket or here on Kolanta. Maybe it's then the time for January to March. Okay. So how do you see this? especially the productivity thing and how so, often do you move? So for me, I, I probably spend, lately I've been spending 10 months a year in Chiang Mai just because I love it. The weather's always good except for like one month of the year, which is this month, which is why I'm in Koh Lanta. Uh, and I normally will go on vacation to places for two or three weeks at a time. You really do some vacations where you say, okay, yeah. um, I leave my working stuff. Uh, no, I, I call it like workation. I still bring my laptop and everything because... I enjoy working, you know, but I'll go somewhere for two or three weeks just to get away, sightsee a bit. And I'll put myself in what I call maintenance mode, where I'm not going to create a new project while I'm away. uh, But I will still log in for two hours a day to check email or fulfill orders, uh, whatever it is. And just have enough money where my goal normally during those vacation periods is not to lose money, is to have whatever passive income that I had set up previously cover the vacation, whether I'm scuba diving somewhere or uh, last year I was in South Africa I went to safari Mm. I just want to make enough money passively so it covers that cost of the the flight and the whatever activities I'm doing and then when I get back to Chiang Mai or I get back to wherever my home my actual base is then I will create a new project and try to create a new stream of passive income Mm -hmm. and what is so special about Chiang Mai Chiang Mai is a magical place, man. <laughs> it's, uh, I think the reason why 
it's so popular with digital nomads is a combination of good weather the whole year and like the friendliness of Thai people. But honestly, I think it's just because that is where everybody, like that's where the majority of people um, were. I think I give credit to Peter Levels uh, from the uh, nomad list for, I think he's the one that really put it on the map. Like, he literally created a map where the, where's the best um, locations of the world for digital nomads. Mm -hmm. And I met him in Chiang Mai uh, actually, while he was building um, this and and a few other of his projects, it's nomadlist.com, right? I think yeah, or .io, I believe. Oh uh, yeah. And uh, so when I had met, so so basically the, the timeline, I guess, of digital nomads in Chiang Mai, right, is a lot of people assume I'm one of the first, but I'm not. Before me, uh, there was uh, the Dynamite Circle. Mm. Uh, the only reason why they didn't popularize it to the general public is because they are a private paid community. And most people don't want to spend $40 a month or something to be a part of it. So they, within their group, their, within their forum, they would tell everyone, hey, how great Chiang Mai is, you should go there. They would organize events within Chiang Mai. Mm. Uh, so I was very lucky to be, f when I first started making money online with my eBooks, uh, I had met a few of them and I started going to their events. Um, and I think I'm one of the first people that started just publicly sharing that knowledge that wasn't within the the... Uh, the paid group, uh, and I started blogging about how great it is, how cheap it is, and, and trying to encourage other people to come, and I started organizing some local events. And then when uh, Peter made the list saying, this is the best place. <laughs> out of 200 or the database is still yeah, growing? Yeah, you know, basically out of the world, this is yeah. the, the best balance of good internet, good community, good Wi-Fi, you know, things like that. Um, that's when people started coming in hordes. And I think, you know, I actually have to thank Peter because if it wasn't for him, nobody would be searching terms like uh, cost of living Chiang Mai or uh, digital nomad Chiang Mai or things like that. Uh, and because he started that, that people would start finding the articles I had written six months or a year before that even. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Very interesting. And I heard even before the Dynamite Circle setting up this event in Bangkok, they have it annually, I think in October, and then normally they all move. Uh, to Chiang Mai, um, there have been many travel bloggers who explored Chiang Mai, and then I don't know, maybe it swapped somehow over to the Dynamite Circle mm. to DC, and then yeah, I mean, know who knows? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure even before all because of us, it's a big question in our community. And many yeah. people ask me as as I'm uh, also quite well connected. So, Marcus, what do you think? Why did it all happen in Chiang Mai? And Oh, I don't know. I heard so many different stuff. Yeah, I mean, Chiang Mai is kind of like the magical place, and I honestly don't think uh, anyone has the, the solid reason because I've been in Chiang Mai now for three, maybe four years, and when I got there, it was I was just doing Muay Thai, so I had no idea there was entrepreneurs. Mm. Uh, and then the first business people I met, like the people, the way we would organize events is we would go on places like Meetup.com or even Couchsurfing and search for terms like. Uh, who has read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Or who has rich, uh, read For Our Work Week? Yeah, yeah. And we would create, a, we would meet up for breakfast every Friday. We call it Paleo Breakfast. Uh, and most of the members were actually from the DC, which is why I, I credit them a lot for the uh, for for starting up uh, the Nomads in Chiang Mai. Um, and when I when I first uh, started doing business online. Pun Space had just opened the co first co-working space in Chiang Mai. They have two, right? Now there's two, uh, and well, now there's actually a bunch of co-working spaces. Now there's like five or ten or something. Oh, I mean, Pun Space. But there's two Pun Spaces, mm -hmm. yeah. And when I first went there, uh, the only people there were a few freelance, uh, either developers or you know, people who are not necessarily doing like. Uh, digital nomad type businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, then there were the people from the DC and then there was like me and a couple friends. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't a big, um, it wasn't a big scene yet. But now when you go, it's, I mean, we organize events, a Friday coffee meetup. Uh, and every week, 40, 50 people will show up mm -hmm. without any advertising. You know, if anything, uh, our venue is, our coffee shop that we picked is too small. Mm -hmm. So we try to like discourage <laughs> too many people from coming because it's everyone's standing. Um, <laughs> and, but it just, it just grows so fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, what are the side effects of this rapid growth? Do you see so far any negative side effects or it's just a big party and everybody's happy what's happening there? I think overall it's great. Uh, I think the only, 
I don't personally care about this because everyone's free to do whatever they want to do. But there are some people who are very angry at the influx of digital nomads. Mainly, it's like older guys in their forties, fifties that have like a Thai wife and kids、yeah. and girlfriend, and they are the original expats. You know, they、oh, are like sometimes they are called expats. Yeah, <laughs> you know, most of them aren't very happy in their life. Maybe maybe they're living off retirement savings, or maybe they have you know、mm. they're on a, like usually on a very tight budget and. The nomad scene actually has brought in so much money into the economy, especially certain areas like the Niemen Heimen area of Chiang Mai, which is like the, you know, which is like the cool, I guess, trendy area where all the co-working spaces and coffee shops are, and it's driven up prices actually,、uh, because usually nomads have a bit more money to spend on apartments or on like food and you know or co-working spaces things like this.、Uh, so there are a few people who. Either have a fixed salary、um, mm-hmm. or are just living off of savings. That they are a bit unhappy that you know we're kind of gentrifying the area and like. But to me, it's like you know what this is evolution, right? You know, it's not like we're kicking people out. We're bringing money in the economy, and it's developing.、Uh, I would say. Part, you know, not just、uh, the nomads itself, but there are thousands of us. So、mm. we are contributing to like. Spending, you know, to a kind of a a a type of tourist that spends more money that wants higher end services.、Mm-hmm. I think what's also beside this aspect very important is to say that the genomists don't take any jobs from the local communities、mm-hmm. as we are working worldwide and in, in the internet and mostly for for where we come from. The, the clients are in the western part of the world. Um, so, so we we don't work as a dive instructor or at the reception of a、mm-hmm. hotel, and people could complain.、Mm-hmm. And additionally to this, this is what, for instance, also Amarit,、uh, a very smart guy, the founder of Hubar,、uh, one of the first co-working spaces in Bangkok, underlines、uh, um, when we talk、um, with each other is that the DJ nomads have so much skills and knowledge. If we combine this knowledge and bring it to local communities. There's where the magic happens, and this is a big opportunity for the local communities and also for for the digital nomads giving something back. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think if all if all of us had moved to let's say Cambodia,、uh, where it's legal, not only legal but it's encouraged to start local businesses, we would probably actually really make a big impact on the economy、uh, by bringing local skills or using our business sense to you know create、uh, offline businesses. The only reason why we don't do that in Chiang Mai or in Thailand is because it's very illegal and it's a lot of、uh, a lot of paperwork. And even then,、uh, it's not very foreigner friendly. You know, it's very, very, very easy to get screwed over,、uh, even if you have lawyers, even if you do everything correctly、mm. uh, out of your business, if it is profitable.、Uh, if you're not profitable and you're just getting by, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. But as soon as you have a, you know, you're making money. Uh, you will get screwed over, and this happens time and time again, which is almost a blessing. It almost kind of forces us to keep our businesses online、uh, and not even think about、uh, creating a, an offline business.、Mm. Um, you know, I would never ever start a business in Thailand because of this.、Uh, but if it was the same laws of Cambodia, where it was really easy, maybe I would have had my own corking space or coffee shop by now.、Mm. And I don't think that's actually what I would want because then I'd be tied down. <laughs> yeah.、Uh, so I'm actually kind of it's almost a blessing. Yeah, I think so. But but you're right. I I also heard the the rumor about this、um, great、uh, NGO project which is going on here, cleaning up the beaches、uh, from Trash Trash Hero.、Um, we put, participated there on Sunday, and I heard if they get too big, then the the government would. Probably stop it because they say no. You're taking away the jobs from other Thai people who. Would be in charge to collect the trash,、mm. but they are not doing it. But it's crazy. Yep.、Uh, you know, <laughs> this is the weird world we live in. So, who knows that if one year, two years, three years from now,、uh, if Chiang Mai or Thailand will still be the hub?、Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why I'm not too concerned is because we are location dependent. We can just pick up and go. And I'm pretty sure with you know even just like your list and my list, we can start. You know, we can say, okay, Thailand is now not no longer digital nomad friendly. Let's all move to the Philippines, or let's all move to Berlin, or whatever it is. And I, I really believe that it will take a few months to really kind of get people
um, to want to move. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think it'll happen. I mean, yeah, it will happen. Yeah. You, you see it um, like Johannes from Bedford Travel just tried to promote Tarifa as, as the new DJ Nomad hub for mm-hmm. the summer, and it worked. And I've been in Tarifa, and there were so many nomads. So whenever who has like a good reach online or is an influencer in this industry tells people, let's go there, they will go there, or like the Dynamic Circle. But yeah. I think um, the Thai people are very aware of this, especially the, the people who run co-working spaces in, in Bangkok. I'm connected to many of them. And um, also Steve, um, the founder of Hubot on Bali, they're very aware and that they're trying to, to build up like a cool environment for digital nomads and, and they are trying to, to collaborate with, with us. So I think at the end, as there's so much knowledge and skill in our, in our nomad community, there will be also a war for talent from local communities where digital nomads should, should gather and go next. So it's yeah. quite exciting. I like it. And, you know, I would love to see more collaboration between, like, let's say local Thai people with mm-hmm. digital nomads, um, knowledge sharing collaborations. I think right now it's partially due to the, a lot of it has to do with the language barrier, uh, the culture, but also because of the actual laws where you're not allowed to hire a, a Thai uh, worker, mm-hmm. but you can hire a Filipino virtual assistant. So people end up doing that just because, mm. you know, you don't want to have any legal financial ties to Thailand. Yeah. So we'll see, we know how that goes, but I mean, it's, it's fun being, you know, kind of being uh, on this journey. <laughs> yeah, totally. As it catched up totally uh, within one year or just what yeah. happened in the, in the last six months. It's, it's crazy. I don't know where it will end, but it's very exciting to be on the roller coaster um, right now. Um, yeah, and it's cool that you're... So, like, when I first heard about the DNX conference, it was actually when we first had the idea to start the Nomad Summit in Chiang Mai. Mm-hmm. I had no idea there were other, like, digital nomad type conferences in the world. And somebody had commented, they're like, oh, you guys are like DNX. And I was like, oh, what's that? So I had to Google it. And I was like, oh, cool. That's like, um, the, like a nomad com- co- conference in Europe. And when I had saw that you guys had come to Bangkok this year, I was so surprised. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because this is the whole point of us this being, concept, yeah. of us being worldwide, location dependent. Uh, and if anything, maybe I'm thinking too small where I love Chiang Mai so much that I do everything there when, in reality, you know, we can be in South America, we can be, you know, really anywhere. We can be anywhere and we, we got lots of requests from people all over the world. Uh, can you come with the DNX to uh, Buenos Aires? We will have a meet up there and maybe see what we can do there. Or can you come to Australia? I want to set up one in New Zealand. So, um, yeah, there are no frontiers anymore. Or the sky is really the limit, especially mm-hmm. in our lifestyle. And yeah, we, as we kicked off the first conference in Berlin, we said, okay, but it's international. It's about digital nomading. It's about roaming all over the world. So the conference will move. Um, and, but coming back to the point of connecting more with the local communities, which is also a big thing for me. And I wrote a long uh, article about this on, on Medium that digital nomads living in a bubble. And we are trying on our camps to bring local entrepreneurs on the camps to give a talk. For instance, in Brazil, we had three local Brazilian entrepreneurs giving talks um, and then people from our camp went into the co-working spaces in Brazil and tried to, to catch up with the with the local people who were working there. Um, then the scene is not too big at the moment but it's catching up so they were giving talks and I think this is how it could work like these vice versa inviting people to our communities and then sending or giving talks at their communities to just get even more together. I like it. I'm glad that you're leading that because that's not really what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I'm very happy being living in my comfortable bubble. Uh, but at the same time, I'm glad that people like you are out there uh, because hopefully in five years, it will be more integrated. Mm-hmm. Totally. So um, now we're here on Kolanta, Thailand. What do you think about the co-hub and why do you decide to come to Kolanta? Uh, I came here because every March in uh, Chiang Mai is the burning season where they burn all the, the crops in the fields for the farmers. Uh, and the smoke gets really bad. That combined with the pollution from the taxis because all that is unregulated where, unlike in Germany or in the US, where you have smog emissions, where you're not allowed to have black smoke come out of, out of your exhaust. In Thailand, due to corruption, they just allow all the taxis to put as much black smoke as they want. And 
during most of the year, it's not that big of a deal unless you're right behind it because the mountain air is so fresh, it just it spreads. And I don't want to see it, uh, but as a foreigner, as a tourist, there's really nothing I can personally do uh, except for support some causes like uh, I donated to this uh, company where they are teaching farmers how to, instead of burn the, the crops, um, to to make a charcoal fertilizer with it. Mm. So they, they make these charcoal bricks um, where they can just soak with um, things like uh, the urine from pigs and make fertil- bio-fertilizer. So there's things like that we can do, uh, but as far as the actual, you know, trying to get the government to enforce uh, smog relation, regulations, that is something they have to, they have to do. Um, so I, so every, you know, every year for two months, I'll either come to Kolanta, which I've been for the last few years, mm. uh, or I'll travel somewhere else. Uh, but the reason why I like Kolanta is it's a beautiful island, you know, great weather, some of the best scuba diving in Thailand, or if not in the world. You're a scuba dive instructor, right? Uh, yeah, I worked as one for uh, many years. I, I love scuba diving. We yeah. have to go together. Yeah, it'll be fun. Sooner. Yeah, I'll enjoy that. Uh, and now that there's this co-working space, uh, there's stable internet. So I'm really happy. I mean, you know, hopefully we'll we'll see Kolan to grow even more. But it's it's a good alternative. It, it, to be honest, it's not my go-to place only. You know, uh, I'm very happy pretty much going anywhere. So maybe next year I'll I'll check out a different island somewhere. Maybe I'll go to Bali. Hopefully, they have better internet by then. <laughs> <laughs> I would check out in, in two weeks. <laughs> we would go there. But yeah, it was a mess when we have been there yeah. three years ago for the first time. But I think as far as I'm concerned, uh, for at least the foreseeable future, uh, I like having Chiang Mai as my base. And then I like exploring different places for a month or two at a time. Yeah, and the cool thing is that there's so many exciting projects popping up every few days you have a new nomad project where you say wow i have to test it out i have to go there a new co-working space is a floating co-working boat um <laughs> like this roam.co where you pay a monthly fee and can check into different locations and always meet directly your community um or just heard about this new co-working space like really really at the beachfront and kopanga mm-hmm. beach hub you want to check out these um so yeah the opportunities are unlimited and sometimes you think well when when do I have the time to catch up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually very exciting seeing all the different like nomad based services. Mm. You know, pretty much anything .io is is, no, is designed for nomads. Uh, or anything but, but, but on the other end, there there's still lots of landing pages just out there without any substance behind yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I think I mean I mean, so here's what, what I would advise to most people is if you want to create a, a business catering just to, to digital nomads. Um, make sure it's something that people are actually willing to pay for it and they're not just signing up because it has the word nomad in it. I think, you know, because we're so excited about this movement, I will sign up for or create an account with pretty much any, any, any nomad something.io mm-hmm. just because I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know, it's for us. But just like a lot of social media startups, uh, it's going to be very hard to create traction or create uh, or monetize it if there's not like a, a need for it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and also what additionally the, the numbers are very price sensitive yeah. because they know how to live on, on minimal costs and yeah. optimize their, their life. Yeah, exactly. And you know, a lot of things are aimed more towards someone who's like first time nomad. Uh, so I think, you know, a lot of these things are good services. Like if you can actually deliver a, um, a value at the end of it. Like after these 30 days, you're going to have this skill or you're going to have this experience, you know, um, versus like, let's say even like a, like a nomad map, which, which I think is really cool because I, you know, I would like to be able to pull up a map on my phone and see where everyone is. I probably would never pay for that. Yeah. There's, there's no, not really a, a reason to, especially once you start meeting, um, once you start getting plugged in or you pick, you know, you show up at a co-working space, you meet enough people where you don't need, to chat online anymore. You don't need to chat in a forum because you can just chat to the people next to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Especially so, these maps are nice to have, like nomad base, nomad trips, I don't know, to catch up. But yeah. whenever you go into these hubs and co-working spaces, you, you meet the people directly and it's way, way more worse. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the main reason why, you know, even though I, I have an account on all the different Slack groups, mm-hmm. I never check it because... Uh, it, I probably only check it the very first day I arrive somewhere new and then I meet people in person and then I say, okay, well, what's your WhatsApp? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that is how it goes. 
so mainly I focus on more, I guess, even though I consider myself now a digital nomad, uh, or I, well, other people consider me a digital nomad, uh, I focus more on location-independent uh, businesses, mostly on building passive income businesses, is because even though there's not necessarily anything to do directly with the digital nomad community, mm-hmm. but it's something that I think everybody everybody can use if they want to just travel more, have more freedom. Even if you're you want to stay in your home country and you just don't want to be in traffic go, and go to work um, and work in a cubicle, have, have the time to bring your your kid to school. Yeah, pick it up. Uh, you know, so to me. Having passive income uh, streams, especially like multiple streams, is something that I will always use, even if I stop traveling. Uh, mm-hmm. Which I don't know if that'll ever happen. But if one day I decide to, I want to live on an organic farm in, you know, in Texas and have four dogs, I would still run my uh, online businesses because I want to have income while being able to do what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And did you find already the holy grail how to set up uh, automated <laughs> passive income streams? Yeah, I mean, so the holy grail is uh, put in whatever work is required to get it up and running uh, and then try to eliminate everything you don't need to do and automate or hire people to do the rest. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in the beginning, I remember the very first time I heard of the word passive income, I I looked it up on like Wikipedia or something and I saw, you know, things like book royalties or music license or... Uh, software, things like that, and I automatically dismissed it, thinking, "Oh, this is not for me. It's, it's I'm, you know, I'm not a writer. I'm not a musician. I, I, I'm not a developer. I cannot do any of this." Mm. And the more I, I guess I actually actually sat down and and did it, I realized, you know what, I can do anything. And and everyone listening to this, you can do anything. You know, you maybe you shouldn't first do a, a iOS app. You know, maybe that's not the first thing you should do. But I guarantee you, there is something out there uh, that you can do uh, as long as you either take the time to learn, uh, either take a course, read a book, uh, or take a class. You know, just like you know, we didn't learn. I mean, we all went to school, you know, and to learn things. I mean, we all read books. Um, there's so much information out there now for free, for free, or uh, Combined that's proven. With a good, good yeah. Of course. Yeah. And honestly, I, I used to be really cheap. <laughs> I used to never want to, to pay for anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now I think about in terms of ROI. I think of in, in terms of money, but also time. Same for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, um, one of the things I'm looking into doing now is publishing more Kindle books. Mm-hmm. And instead of, and I've actually already done it, I figured it out myself, but it took me six months to do. And I think I can, I pretty much know what to do. So I can probably figure it out again on my own with free information. But I know it'll take me, let's say, an extra two months to do it. Or I can just pay, you know, for a course and say, okay, let me condense this. Let me have access to the instructor and ask them questions. Uh, let me have like a step by step formula. And if I can sh- sh- uh, shave one or two or three months off of that period and start making the money faster. Not only do I have a better chance of it actually being successful and not giving up halfway because it's too much work or because I get stuck somewhere, uh, but also in those two months that I've saved, maybe my passive income from that would have already paid for, for the class. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now I'm a big believer in, in taking it. Uh, mm-hmm. So I would say the magic formula is find something that, that you want to do. Find, like, ask around. I would say the best way is to ask for personal recommendations from friends or, um, you know, at least even listen to like an interview on a podcast or something. So you can kind of get to know the person a little bit more than rather just re- read like a sales page or a, watch a sales video. Mm. Uh, and or go into these local communities in Chiang Mai. And yeah, or ask someone in person. You know, yeah. say, do you know, have you ever met anyone who it makes money from XYZ? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, how, you know, do you know anyone who's taken this course and is successful? Yeah. Uh, and for for example, I think uh, Amazon FBA is a very huge topic at the moment yeah. in Chiang Mai. So you just could Meet go into someone. the community and say, <laughs> yeah. "Did you take a course? Are you successful? Can you show me your dashboard? <laughs> maybe maybe if you get better relationship to him." Yeah. But yeah, get into it, and I can totally underline what you were saying. It was also a mind shift for us that before that I was never willing to pay for for um, condensed information because mm. I thought it's it's for free out there anyway. But now I see it. Okay, it saves us X amount of time, mm. and this time we can already start our Amazon business. So we, we 
um, paid lots of money for for a big Amazon FBA course, but mm -hmm. I'm sure it will pay out at the end. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, because it's step by step, you're not going to waste six months learning about, let's say, SEO when it's not really relevant to what you need to do right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think this is the biggest problem that people fall on is. Pretty much any time someone asks me uh, for, for advice, and I'm always happy to help guide people. So someone messaged me or something or leaves a comment. But I can always tell when they haven't been through a course because they ask me unrelated questions. You know, They ask me a question about something that they maybe will help after they're already making $10,000 a month, yeah. but is not necessary when they are just starting. Mm. You know, uh, And I, I, I'll call them out on it too. I'll say, like, look, just follow a freaking step. You know, like, like you're wasting your time. Uh, yeah. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to do it. And six months later, they'll message you again and say, oh, well, what about this? And I'm like, what have you done in the last six months? You know, how much, like, how much, what was the opportunity cost in the last six months that you've missed out on? And I think the biggest problem with that is some of these people become very jaded where they're like, oh, FBA doesn't work. Amazon sucks, you know, or, you know, and it's because they didn't follow through, uh, you know, or they, they only spend all the time looking for the downsides of it. And yeah. I promise you there are downsides to every business out there. Every relationship out there, every <laughs> TV show out there, there's downsides to everything. And if you spend every lifestyle, yeah, if you spend all of your time looking at the downsides, you will never ever see the upsides. Uh, so pick something that that works. Uh, maybe ask one or two people in person, and as, as long as it works for somebody, like it's probably you know there's a good chance it works for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, how do you get structured in your work done? Do you have Routines you set up over the time, is it easy for you or is it still a challenge as in, it is for many online entrepreneurs? In the beginning, it was a big challenge because um, I'm a bit lazy, to be honest. <laughs> I think the only reason why I'm very productive now is because I know 100% in my heart that, that if I'm, whatever I do is going to have a benefit in the future, mm -hmm. whether it's going to be you know, a week from now or a month from now, or maybe it takes six months to see the benefit. I know whatever I do is going to have some kind of benefit. So mm -hmm. it's very easy for me to be focused. Well, in the beginning, uh, let's say I was writing a, a blog post or l uploading products to my Josh shipping store. Before I made a first sale, I would think, oh, am I just wasting my time doing this? And then it's very easy to get distracted or get disheartened and not want to do it. But now that I know uh, there is, you know, the work that I put in, is going to have some kind of reward in the future, mm -hmm. I'm very happy to, to actually sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. um, I actually wrote on my blog, johnnyft.com, my daily ritual. I think it's called, I think if you search for um, morning success habits or daily ritual, I br basically outline exactly what I do from the, the moment I wake up until I go to bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's pretty much the same every day, but just kind of give a brief overview of it. Uh, I like waking up pretty early, uh, mm -hmm. 7 30, um, you know, which is not, you know, crazy early, but I like to, I like to be one of the first ones in the office. Yeah. This is what I, I recognize when Philly and me arrive. We are also early birds yeah. in, in the, um, space here. It's normally it's empty, but there's one dedicated table. I see it. It's your stand. Yeah. And <laughs> Johnny is, is there and also on the weekends. And I think at the end, this, this really makes a difference. Yeah. And I just get into a routine where I say, okay, in the mornings, the first hour, I fulfill my orders from a dropshipping store, get that out of the way. Uh, for the next hour, I, check my email and then in the afternoons I will do uh, creative things I either write a blog post or interview someone on the Travel Like a Boss podcast or do something else that I, I really enjoy doing because I know uh, in the mornings I've already made all the money I need for the day so in the afternoons I can do things that may or may not ever make me any money but I enjoy doing mm -hmm. yeah yeah same for me I always start with the most important tasks or eat the frog like Mm -hmm. The thing that has the most impact on your business, but in most cases, it's the thing you tend to procrastinate on. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you have the biggest amount of headspace and willpower in the in the beginning of the day, where you didn't have to take too many decisions yet, always go for this most important task. And then, as you said, in the afternoon, I go more for like catching up with emails, collaborations, other things I just like to do which may have an impact or not. Yeah, life hack is profit first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool, Johnny. Thanks for your time. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for, for chatting with you. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, uh, bit, really appreciate it. Yeah, bitte schön. <laughs> <laughs> Danke sehr. And it's a bit fun, man. Yeah, it's a good fun. And see you soon somewhere, probably in Chiang Mai. We'll come there for yeah, sure. Please do let me, let me know. If anyone ever wants to reach out, Johnny FD. Yeah, we will put it in the show notes. Um, all the links we mentioned, Johnny FD and uh, Travel Like a Boss podcast. And I'm sure you, you have lots of other projects. But yeah, I mean, I, the blog is the easiest way to find me. Just, just go there. Okay. Right. Let's do it. Thanks. Cool. Peace and out. See ya. Yes, yes, yo, this was another episode of the Life Hacks Show. If you love what you are listening to and can use some of the tools and hacks we are sharing on the Life Hacks Show, I would be more than happy if you can give me a review or rating on iTunes. Follow me on facebook.com slash Moira Markus and just ping me and give me some feedback that would mean the world to me. So long, have fun, peace and out. <laughs>